talk us uh, about uh, the Kimura equation. Thank you, Fabio, and okay. please go on. Okay, uh, and uh, thank you, John, for the, the introduction. I also would like to thank George for the invitation and also for the support to stay here at IMPA a little bit longer than the conference. So I'm going to talk about the Kimura equation. The Kimura equation is very well known among biologists, especially evolutionary biologists and some people in, in mathematical biology, but with focus in the evolutionary theory. But it's not a well-known equation outside um, this very specific field. So before going to the, um, to the results that um, which are basically with Max Souza, that is one of the organizers of the conference, and is here. You can address all difficult questions to Max. It's also a result of joint work with uh, Olga Danukina and two colleagues from Portugal, Ana Ribeiro and Leonardo Monsignon, that will appear in the very end um, of this talk. And uh, I would like to think about what this flag here represents, but if you are really curious, you can ask me later on. The others, I'm sure that you know where I'm from. So, the Kimura equation was introduced by um, a Japanese geneticist, uh, Moto Kimura, in uh, 1954. That's basically this equation here. It's a linear PDE, so nothing that special. Um, it's a drift diffusion equation. So we have here um, a term related to random evolution, so a diffusion term, and here a drift term, where phi is the probability density to find a population with a certain fraction x of individuals of a given type. What does this mean? That I have a population, finite size population, and divide this population in two groups. Let's think about uh, dark eyes and blue eyes, doesn't matter. Can be anything that is really discrete and can divide the population in these two groups. And uh, x gives the fraction of individual of a given type in this population. And phi is the probability density to find the population at st state x at time t. And what Kimura said is basically that this function evolves according to a certain um, equation. And here we have two model parameters that was not well established in this paper. But later on, in 62, he reformulated the problem. And he uh, said exactly who would be these parameters here. So p here is, in fact, x. X, there's a, a little, it's, the paper is a little bit confused in terms of notation, starts with a certain P, and here X. But the main difference between these two equations is that he introduced the Kimura, what is now called the Kimura equation, as a forward equation, and then he realized that it was much easier to work in, in, in a backward equation. So formally, these two equations are adjoint. So the, the second derivative is basically the same one, so just put this term outside, and the first one has also to change the sign. This is just form our joints in mathematical terms. So this takes basically eight years to Kimura to reformulate the problem in the, in the formulation that becomes well known. So for 90% of the, the evolutionary biologists work in the Kimura equations, this is what's called the Kimura equation. There are some fringes see, in the process that people that prefer to work in a slightly different equation. Um, these two parameters here that appear in the equation now, this x is called the selection force, means it measures the strength of natural selection. And now in this other parameter here is the effective population. It's not exactly the same of the population. It's, a, it's a quite a confusing concept, but that's directly related to the size of the population in a in naive sense. Uh, yeah. X is P, right? X is P. It changes in the middle of the paper, basically. And I kept this changing here. Um, so basically, he has two parameters to, mo to model here. If n goes to infinity, say going to a, a very, very large population, the random term will disappear. We have only a deterministic equation. So basically, a PDE reformulation of an, an ODE. Um, the interpretation of this U, which is now uh, the, the, the unknown from that joint equation, is slightly different from this phi. U is basically the probability of a fixation of a mutant gene in a population if we start with p individuals of that type. Remember that the, the, the model problem consists in the division of the population into two types, and we study the evolution of the fraction of the first type. So that's the direct evolution. In the backward evolution, 
we know that one of the type will dominate the population in the long run. And so basically, you consider P the initial amount of individuals of the first type, and U is the probability that in the long run, the entire population will be given by individuals of this focal type. So the boundary conditions here are clear, because if you start with zero individuals of, the, um, of this type, the probability of fixation will be zero. And if the population is full of individuals of the first type, zero individuals of the second type, then the, the fixation probability will be one. Here, we don't talk about boundary condition. That's an interesting problem that we're going to discuss afterwards. So Kimura is more known in the biological, mathematical biological literature as the author of the neutral theory of evolution. We really think that's a, a very common mistake to think about evolution as a synonym from natural selection, and they are not. Natural selection is one of the mechanisms of the evolution. Evolution is basically differentiation uh, uh, with respect to time. In fact, variation in the genetic frequency uh, uh, with respect to time. Natural selection is one of the reasons why this happens. And we give a lot of focus to the natural selection in general, but that's not the case. So what Kimura found is that studying um, the change in nucleotides in a, in, in a family of DNAs, this change is too fast to be explained only by natural selection. So it changed a little bit the, the focus of the study of the, of the evolution from natural selection to random evolution. So that this simply happens with uh, a lot of frequency. There is a lot of variation in the population that cannot be expe uh, explained from natural selection. So the typical Darwinian ex um, explanation for a, a certain fact would be the following. If you see the population where 99% of individuals shares a single gene, then you look for a reason for that, look for an evolutionary advantage for that. When you go to the neutral, select, neutral field of evolution, there is no reason to look for an advantage of carrying this specific gene. This can be only a random effect, and you'll be more uh, important in small populations than in large populations. That's, not, uh, that's something that Darwin knew, in, a fa in fact. When he, uh, he was quite impressed about evolution in islands, it's basically because he was seeing small populations, and evolution in small populations is much uh, faster than evolution in large populations, something that we will see mathematically in a moment. But the problem about the, the neutral theory of evolution started in the following year, when two American biologists uh, discussed it, Kimura ideas calling this non-Darwinian evolution in a paper at Science. And so if you look around and if you Google Kimura terms, you probably will find some guy uh, doing mixed martial arts, as Diogo did. <laughs> but you, you can find a lot of other people with uh, the name Kimura. But if you focus on evolution, you basically will see a lot of strange people saying that Kimura proved that Darwin was wrong and something like this. But this was not the case. This was just a, a confusion that started with this paper, when he basically, um, th these guys understood that Kimura was changing one of the main focus of the evolution from natural selection to random evolution. So basically what we are going to do here um, in the next few hours is to discuss this interplay between random evolution and natural selection. Kimura is very well known from this equation here, mutant gene will ap uh, which appear in a finite population will eventually either be lost from the population or fixed in it, means the following, that if you have a population and some people have one gen and other people uh, in, in the rest of the population um, doesn't have this gen, gene, then in the long run or either everyone will share it or this will disappear. Mathematically speaking, it's the following. If you take the Kimura equation, and here I'm using a slightly different version of the, the Kimura equation because uh, I allowed um, natural selection to not be constant, as in the original paper. This means that as time goes by, this function phi, I mean here with the forward evolution, will converge to a linear combination of two direct deltas. The first one means that we have a certain C naught probability that the population will be found at state zero. State zero means that the focal time, focal type, the, 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 the type that we're really interested in disappeared, was extinct. And C1 is the probability that in the long run it was established in the population, meaning that all individuals in the, this population will share 
this specific genie. So basically, that's the, the Kimura equation. That's the solution we're expecting for it. So we have to fill the gaps and understand all the details of the models. So what we're going to discuss today is the following. We're going to start with a certain stochastic process, finite population, discrete generation, and then we are going to introduce a lot of mathematical assumptions, and from this we go exactly to the Kimura equation, which is for infinite populations and continuous time. The assumptions will be basically continuous time, so we have discrete generations, generations, uh, one generation, a time step of delta t, a second generation, and so on. This delta t should converge to zero. Infinite population, and the total number of individuals in this population, this should go to infinity, but they should respect a certain relation here. They should not go to zero and infinity in a random way. They have to respect each other. And also have to introduce a more biological assumption called the weak selection, which was introduced here for mathematical reasons, but that's a, a very well-established biological assumption. Then from the Kimura equation, we go to the infinite population. Kappa is the inverse of the defective population size. When kappa goes to zero, then basically we have a very well-known model in, in evolutionary game theory, which is closely related to, to population genetics, called the replicator equation. It's also in infinite population, but continuous, but only for short times. It will not be valid in the long run. So after doing that, we're doing, uh, we have to study the stochastic process by itself. We have to understand what's, uh, what's going on here, but this is a very, very classical topic. I'm not going to, to expend a lot of time here. We have to understand the Kimura equation. This is somehow new. Remember that I said that the forest um, Kimura equation has no boundary conditions, at least was not imposed in one. We're going to see that this is a very interesting mathematical problem. And also we are going to, again, to deduce to do exactly the same deduction from the stochastic process to the Kimura equation, then from the Kimura equation to the replicator equation, but to using a completely different formulation of the problem. This is an ongoing work, so not everything here is well established, but this is a very, very indirect de deduction. We're going to see that we have to introduce an uh, intermediate step between these two equations to make this deduction correct. So let's go back. So what's the problem here, we have a finite population, this example, I have uh, nine individuals uh, divided in two types, blue and red, and then we say that the state of the population is five, because we have five blue individuals, or if you prefer, the state of the population is five ninths. So that's the fraction of blue individuals. We are at time t minus one, and then after a time step delta t, we are at time t. Of course, something happened, and the population changed from one time to the other one, and then we go on and go on, go on, go on. Uh, what we really need to impose here is a kind of update rule, meaning um, some kind of rule that says from this population, we go to this population for a certain probability, and of course, we have to tell about all possible uh, situations here. So basically, from certain initial condition, we have to establish uh, a certain set of numbers, what we call here mi, uh, 1i, m2i, which says that the probability that it jumps from that state, i, here, which is 5, to 1, 0, two, three, four, nine, so on, to all possible states. So, in fact, we have to give all possible transitions, and basically we, are we have to give certain stochastic matrix linking all two possible states. So the situation will be the following. We have to link all, all uh, possible states and give the probability, and that's basically our, uh, our central modeling assumptions to give a certain matrix related to all possible states in the population. If there are no mutations in the, in the population, this was a central assumption in many of the models that we're going to discuss. Of course, something that in a certain moment we need to relax, but that's not uh, so easy. Uh, in fact, it's much easier, but does not give any useful hint for the original problem, which is without mutations. So if there are no mutations in the population, then we have two absorbing states, all blue, state nine, and all um, red state zero. If we have a population only of red balls and they are reproducing without mutations, every red ball will generate a new red ball. So this, the new state of the population will be all red. So this is an absorbing state, it's a stationary state. Evolution stops when we reach one of these two 
um, to states. So in the end, for any initial condition, what we have is the fixation of blue balls or the extinction of blue balls, exactly what Kimura said, and that's the point that we are trying to model here. What we can say is the fixation probability, F, that will depend on the initial state, and the complementary pro probability, which is the extinction probability. If we continue to go on, this will be exactly the same state. There is no evolution anymore in the sense that Gini frequencies are not changing in time. So let's go to a more specific example. Uh, we consider a population of fixed size N composed by two types of individuals, A and B. And we define a certain function, PI, the probability that a type A individual is selected for reproduction in a population with I type A individuals and the complementary number of type B individual. And MIJ is the transition probability between steps J and I. Of course, we are going to build this matrix M on, this, uh, on the set of, fixation, uh, on the set of uh, selection probabilities PI. What is called the Moran process which was introduced in 6.2 as a simpler example to study biology, uh, evolutionary biology, is the following. We consider that each time step, I kill one individual with random probability, and I select one individual to reprodu reproduction according to this model parameter, pi, here. So the probability that I go from a state i to a state j, which is one, um, sorry, from the state J to the state I, where I is just one, is the probability that I kill an individual of type B, which with this probability, and then I reproduce an individual of type A. The probability that I go from uh, J to I, where I is J minus one, is the probability that I kill a type A individual, and then I reproduce a type B individual. The probability that I stay exactly in the same uh, state is, only the complementary one. So that's uh, have to, the, the columns of the matrix add to one. And another process, which is more biological ba biologically based in a sense, is called the Wright-Fisher process, which is introduced in the 20s and 30s, independently by Fisher and Wright, which is basically the following. They are trying to model um, reproductions in trees in the sense that they produce some fruits, and then the, they produce different number of fruits, and the fruits fall in the in fall or some animal take it and bring to another place. But the only way that they are competing is in, the, uh, in terms of the, the, the number of fruits that each tree is producing at a certain time. So basically what happens is the fall. And, and, and the environment is saturated. So the next generation will have exactly the same number of trees of the previous generation. So basically what happens is the probability that a certain tree um, gives rise to a new tree in the next generation of the exact the same times, the direct descendant will be proportional to the, to, to the number or to the probability that a certain fruit is selected from this tree. So the number of uh, fruits that this tree produces. This is a very um, complicated way to say that this is basically an urn model where I have red balls and blue balls and then I take from a, a, a urn with n balls, I take n balls putting it back. So I, Pick one and say red, reproduce one red, put it back, and take blue, reproduce one blue, and do this n time. Then from one set of balls, I go to a new set of balls, but I don't take this blue and red balls with the same probability, but according to this probability pi, which is a model parameter. So these are the two main models that are used um, in finite population evolutionary biology. There are others, of course. Uh, in the neutral case, what is called neutral case, so there is no advantage to be blue or red, it's just two different manifestations. There are some situations that we don't think there are advantage are only different. This is called the, the neutral case. In the neutral case, the probability to select a blue ball will be exactly equal to the fraction of blue balls in the, in the basket, in the urn, meaning that uh, we have exactly the same probability to select blue and red, that's why it's neutral. The weak selection approximation says that this probability should change from the neutral one according to the time step between two uh, successive generations and to a certain functions. I mean, this is just rephrasing the same thing. Instead of modeling according to this P 
a model according to this theta, but this will make much easier to work when you go to the continuous model like the Kimura equation or the replicator equation. And this function theta here has a more direct biological interpretation. It's called the fitness difference between the two types. Fitness is basically the ability that one individual has to, um, to generate descendants in the next uh, generation. So the fitness of someone who has very strong resistance against a disease will be larger than a fitness that someone that does not has uh, this resistance because this second guy has a more uh, a higher probability to die. In the direct evolution, um, we saw that there is a duality between uh, direct and backward evolution. The direct evolution let capital Phi be the probability to find the population at state i at time t, then the probability that I, that I find the population at state i at time t plus delta t will be the probability that the population was at time j in the previous time and then change from j to i. And then I add over all j's, not i's. Um, in the continuous limits, this will generate an equation of this form, dt phi equals set an operator phi, but I don't have any indications about boundary conditions in this problem, and that's exactly what happens in the forward Kimura equation. For the adjoint equation, I study a, um, a certain adjoint variable, which is the fixation probability at time t or later. If it fixates or, or goes to extinction, this will be forever, so time t or later. If the initial condition is given by uh, a certain chronic or delta supported at i, meaning that I'm sure that the population started with i individuals of the first type. Then the fixation probability starting from j um, after time t plus delta t will be the probability that it, in the first step, jumped from j to i, and then it fixates in time, uh, time, uh, time t from the initial condition i. So this, is, this will be basically an adjoint evolution with respect to this one. Here that's, I apply m, and here I apply m dagger to the vector f. So basically the equation will be this one, but with this very um, useful remark that here the boundary conditions are very, very well established and this problem is, in a sense, much simpler than this one. So let's do some simulations to understand what's going on here. Um, I, um, I split the problem in three different examples for people which understand evolutionary game theory or game theory in general. These examples are the most important examples in two-player uh, game theory. It's called the dominance, coexistence, and coordination. Dominance means that one individual has always higher fitness than the other one. Doesn't matter the state of the population, it's better to be this kind of individual than the other one. Coexistence, so this, um, the, the flow of the evolution will be to increase the, the, um, the frequency of type A individual, which is the best one. In the coexistence case, the evolution will lead to a certain stable coexistence point in between. In the coordination case, evolution tries to split the population into different groups, and these groups converge to the extremities, meaning that there is a probability for extinction, a probability to fixation, and this will depend strongly on the initial condition. These numbers here are just uh, functions that simulate very well these three cases. So let's do this again. I start with the same initial condition. In the dominance case, I simply accumulate towards one, and then means that the, the, the first type fixates. In the coordination case, as you can see here, we have a division into two groups, meaning that very quickly we go from one type or the other type, but it's very unlikely to see the population as, as a mixed stable condition. But in the coexistence case, something different happens. The population evolves toward a mixed state that takes really a lot of time to disappear. Remember that the population is only 50 here. If uh, I put a larger population, we will not see the, um, this diffusion, this very slow diffusion. But the important point here is that we have a very uh, clear situation with two time scales. One time scales that, uh, that is related to the convergence of this interior point here, and a second time scale related to the disappearance of this mass towards the extremities. You can see that's going to disappear here and accumulate here. And this is a feature of the Kimura equation that is exactly what we're going to discuss, discuss in a moment. 
But we're not talking about the Kimura equation. We're talking about the right Fisher process or the Moron process, in this case, the simulation for the right Fisher process. But what we want now is to write a PDE, a continuous partial differential equation, that's a good approximation that what we're going to uh, we're seeing in these three simulations. Yeah? This is finite population. This is just um, a right Fisher process that's simulated. The point is that when I'm going to, to develop a, a continuous equation to have exactly this situation, that will be a problem. Okay. So let's um, study in a closer detail the right Fisher process. So we have psi, the probability at a time t, there are x times capital N, mutants in a population of fixed size N evolving with time steps of order delta t. The evolution equation is given by this one, as we discussed. Now I'm putting explicitly the parameters N and delta T. And this is the tra transition probability from I to X. The evolution equation is given by this one. So that's a, a linear process. M is a stochastic matrix, uh, the matrix of the right Fisher process. And basically we're studying the evolution of a certain finite vector when applied to M in successive applications. Uh, so the, the solution is obviously the, the central point is just to, to obtain this matrix M raised to any power K or kappa that you want. That's just a numerical analysis problem, not, nothing that serious. Um, but what we can prove very easily is that this matrix, the right Fisher matrix M, when raised to the power kappa and kappa goes to infinity, will converge to a matrix which is non zero in the first and in the last rows, and it's zero everywhere else. Uh, this vector f satisfies the adjoint equation. Um, this vector f here is a solution of the adjoint equation, or it's an eigen vector of the, of the transpose matrix M, with f0 equals 0 and fn equal 1. So basically what we're saying here is that any initial condition um, will be in the long run, it will converge to a certain stationary state and it will be concentrated at end points. So that's exactly the mathematical formulation of Kimura said before that every mutant gene will be either be extinct or fixed. Extinct means that it's, uh, it concentrates the first entry of the matrix, that's the probability to have zero type A individuals, and the fixation is the weight of the last entry of the vector because that's the probability to have um, in individuals of that type. But the interesting point here, that's what I want to call your attention because that's the, the way that we're solving the, the, the puzzling problem of the, the boundary conditions, the following. The matrix, the, the right Fisher matrix and the Moran matrix, and that's very general for models without mutations, have, has a leading eigenvalue, which is one, but this eigenvalue is doubly generated, meaning that we have two linearly independent eigenvectors associated to it. And this is very clear because one of the eigenvectors is simply 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, meaning that the population is, at, um, is only of red balls. So the probability to, to find a blue ball is zero. A population of only red balls will be constant according to this evolution, it will continue to be a population of red balls. And the same thing for blue balls. So the vector 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 is also an eigenvector associated to the eigenvalue 1. But if this is true for the matrix M, this is also true for the ma matrix M dagger, the adjoint matrix. This means that we have two eigenvectors associated to the eigenvalue 1 of the, the adjoint matrix. One is very clear, which is the 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, because when you multiply by the matrix, this is simply uh, adding over the columns, and this is a stochastic matrix the sum converges to one. But there is a second one, which is this vector f, that's the same vector that appears here. Um, and this fact together means the following, that we have certain conservation laws associated to the right Fisher process, to the Moran process, and these conservation laws are the following. I start with any initial condition, and at any time, the inner product of the vector one, 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 one will be constant. That's clear, that's just um, the sum of probabilities should be constant, one. But also the inner product if this vector f will be constant. If you don't believe, think that uh, psi t is m applied to the previous condition, then take the adjoint to the other side, but f is the eigenvector of the adjoint by definition, and so we have f 
and then you have a conservation law. So these two conservation laws of the stochastic process will help us to, um, to present in, a mat in mathematically sound terms the Kimura equation. So let's go back to what I think is the last uh, time that this, this expression will, will appear. Uh, a mutagene will appear in a finite population, will eventually either be lost from the population or be fixed and established in it, and that's the Kimura that I'm interested in. And, but I have to make a, a, um, an opposite view that not every time we are really interested in the long run. Sometimes we are interested in intermediate term, terms. So that's maybe true, but even though not exactly what we're looking for, that's exactly what you saw in the simulation of the coexistence term. We have something that is robust in between, that takes a lot of time to disappear. And this is also interesting. So we go here from stochastic process, right, Fisher, and more on to the Kimura equation. So we look for a differential equations that approximate the discrete evolution of psi when n goes to infinity and delta t goes to zero. And um, what we do? We simply take some kind of inner product, uh, including space and time, this is by definition, uh, and use now the, the, the Moran process. It's just simpler. The right Fisher process will give exactly the same thing. Uh, in the Moran process, it's a little bit simpler because I only need to consider a joint state. Because if you are at state i, the next time it will be i plus 1, i minus 1, or i. Because at each time step, only one individual will die, and then another one, possibly the same one, we replace it. So we have jumps only of size one. And then we do this and use usual tricks of um, adjoints, because these are sums and so on, so on, so on. Then here comes the important assumption. Then we use um, the expansion in the inverse of the population size, and then we have this inner product evolves like this. And now you use the definition of the modern process that I presented before with the weak selection principle that I also presented before. And what happens is that we have exactly this equation here. So the last assumption that we need is a relation between the time step delta t and the population size n. So imposing this scaling law, something very typical when you do statistical mechanics, you have to, to go from uh, particle systems to a, a, a fluid equation, gas dynamics and so on. Uh, we relate the, the way that we contract time and the way that we increase the population size, and then we have a weak formulation of a certain PD. So let's go to the stronger formulation, which it's not uh, so simple to treat mathematically, but much simpler to understand what's going on here. So the stronger formulation of the previous equation, ignoring higher order terms, is this one. And so we finish uh, given two values for these two parameters, mu and ni, that appears when I relate one to the, the time step and the population size and the weak selection principle. Nu appears from the relation between the, the fitness difference delta, theta and the function p used in the definition of the modern process, and mu appears in the relation between the time step and the population size. So these are two model parameters that when I put together, I can have three possibilities for this. Or either I highlight the diffusion term, and then I have a diffusion equation, or I highlight the deterministic term, then I have a drift equation, which is exactly the PD version of the so-called replicator equation, or I can balance both effects and have the Kimura equation in a slightly generalized form because now uh, I, I allow a non-constant fitness difference between two individuals. What means that? Constant fitness difference, which is introduced in the beginning of the last century, basically, people start to think only about constant fitness difference because it's mathematically convenient, not because of biological reasons. In fact, when biologists started to talk about fitness, they were thinking about non-constant fitness. But when mathematicians entered in the game, they started to think about constant fitness because that's uh, what is easy to, to work with. And then this became um, a landmark assumption in this problem. So basically, Kimura worked with a constant fitness here, meaning that we have two individuals, one is the best, period. Someone processes better, uh, the, the oxygen has a stronger uh, capacity to digest, doesn't matter. It's always better than to be the other. 
But in other situations, that's not the case. In other situations, what you do depends on what others are doing. This appears for the first time in animal contest, but it appears in, very, in a lot of different situations where the best that you do for ourselves depends on what all the others are doing. So this would be a non-constant fitness. And here we have a very, very general situation um, for non-constant fitness with this theta of x. So this is a slightly generalization of the Kimura equation. But the important and interesting point here is that we had two conservation laws in the stochastic model, in the right fisher process. And now we have a continuous counterpart of these conservation laws. So we impose in the Kimura equation now two conservation laws. One is just the probability conservation. And the second one is exactly the one that we had before with this vector f. But now the vector f is not f is a function pi, and this pi is simply the solution of the adjoint evolution, like f was the eigenvector of the adjoint operator, with prescribed boundary conditions. In fact, we can solve this explicitly. And when we put this here, we have a second conservation loss. This conservation loss was not here, was not in the Kimura equation. This is a separate assumption, but assumption that comes directly from the stochastic process that we were studying studying before. Uh, theorem, if you consider here the, the weak formulation, there is a unique solution phi in this space here, a BM plus is, is a set of bounded measures, positive bounded measures, uh, such that these two conservation laws are obeyed. Um, this solution is given by a linear combination between a certain direct uh, distribution supported at x equals zero, times a time-dependent coefficient, plus another direct, direct delta distribution supported at, at x equal one times a certain, a certain coefficient, function of time, plus a smooth continuous function that behaves beautifully and goes to zero when t, t goes to infinity. These two functions are non-decreasing. It is the fact that they are non-decreasing um, uh, the fact that they are not decreases is, is closely related to the idea that extinction is forever. So if one type goes extinct, it will not start coming back, so this function should increase. And the same thing appears here. Um, so in the long run, this function phi will converge to a combination of direct deltas. And this is the counterpart, the continuous counterpart of the idea that every mutant gene will be extinct or fixate in the long run. Um, Pi 1 is the fixation probability that will depend on the initial condition. And uh, pi naught, which is the complementary, is the extinction probability. So if you start in a very well-defined state, meaning I start with a fraction x naught of type A individuals, then the fixation probability will be simply pi of x naught that justifies the interpretation of pi as a fixation vector. And in fact, this is the continuous counterpart of the vector f for exactly the same reasons. And more important than that, this, the solution of the Kimura equation, as I defined it in the previous slide, in the weak formulation, is the limit of the solution of the right fisher process when n goes to infinity, delta t goes to zero, all the assumptions that are used. So it, the, this vector converts, after some technical details, to the continuous function phi, which is the solution of the Kimura equation. So in fact, what you have is a PDE such that its solution is, well, uh, is a good approximation of the discrete process. Well, in nature, populations are always finite. They can be very, very large, but they are always finite. So working with process, with models that, that consider that the population are infinite a priori, maybe not a good idea. What we need is a model that uh, is a good approximation for a very large population. That we're going to see what does it mean to, to use an infinite population a priori. So the Kimura equation is a continuous equation, so uh, for in, in X. So in a sense, it's for infinite population. You can have any um, increase, any, po uh, any natural number can represent an increase any between zero and one, can represent the fraction of individuals uh, in the population. But it's a good approximation or of 
uh, the right feature process for finite populations. So it's a good idea to use the Kimura approximation if the population is large. What does it mean? It's large, that depends the, the, in the, on the error that we're, um, that we're willing to accept. If we accept an error of 10 to minus 2, then the population should be at one size. But if you accept only error of 10 to minus 4, then the population should be much larger and so on. But the idea that this converge, so it's a good approximation. Um, but there is one more important point that I uh, discussed about the replicator equation. So if I consider that the fitness difference theta is smooth, the initial condition is smooth, and I call RK the regular part of the solution of the Kimura equation. Remember that the Kimura equation has two Dirac deltas on the boundaries plus one regular part on the interior. And let RK be the regular part of the Kimura equation for a given positive K. And then I compare this with the solution of the Kimura equation when K equals zero. Then the, this difference is bounded, but only for finite times. So this means that the, the replicator equation, which is extensively used in evolutionary game theory or to model evolutionary process, um, is a good approximation for finite times of the Kimura equation. But the Kimura equations are good approximations for all times of the right Fisher process or the Moron process. So the replicator equation is a good approximation for finite times, large populations, continuous times, weak selection of the stochastic process that we have um, in the beginning. The replicator equation, for people that don't know, is just this very simple equation key that was introduced by Taylor and Jonker in 78. But if you want some more pedagogical reference, I would recommend half bar and Sigmund's Evolutionary Game in Population Dynamics book. So let's see if this continuous approximation is a good one. Here I compare the, the exact solution using, not exact solution, but the solution of the right Fisher process using numerical analysis methods which have very small error bars, so I don't even put here, which are this, um, these uh, yellow squares here, and also the best continuous approximation of the process. The population is only 20, so you can see that with a very small population, we have a very good approximation in the continuous limit. The same thing for a situation of dominance. Here, co uh, coordination, dominance, and coexistence are names that came from this matrix here that are very classical in evolutionary game theory, but I'm not going to, to discuss why is that. But you can see here that the, the continuous approximation uh, is really, really good, even if the population is extremely small, like 20 individuals. So let's do some generalizations. We consider n individuals of n, a small n, different types. Now, in the beginning, we had only two types, blues, uh, blue and red. Now we have a finite number of times. I'm not talking about continuous types. Uh, and we define for each type of fitness psi i. Now the evolution is on the n minus 1 dimensional simplex, which is the set of no negative vectors that add to 1. Very good to describe probability vectors. The next generation is obtained from the previous one. Each individual descends from one of the types and blah, blah, blah. Probability proportional to the fitness function that I just gave. That's the right Fisher process in multi-type evolution. We consider the limit of large population in small time steps, and in the end, we have a generalization of the Kimura equation for n types exactly like this, where d is the diffusion coefficient, which, uh, which is a matrix. This matrix has positive determinants in the interior of the simplex, but are exact, uh, this matrix has exactly zero determinants on, on the boundary of the simplex, so this is a degenerated diffusion. And these omega j's here are exactly the replicator equations when um, we consider the evolution of n different types. This is also introduced in the 78s. This is a very natural generaliz generalization of um, what I just presented. But now we have n conservation laws. And this n conservation law will, give, will be given by the n, um, n eigenvectors of the adjoint matrix associated to the eigenvalue 1. Um, so basically, when we want to, so to solve the, um, um, when we want to solve the adjoint Kimura equation to have fixation probabilities, we basically don't have initially uh, boundary conditions in the entire boundary. We have boundary conditions only on the, the vertex, but the equation is exactly the same on the boundaries and the interior, so we have to solve the equations for each boundary from uh, n equals 2 to the, to the maximum number of type, and we, we solve this hierarchically. So this is a, a very different problem. We didn't, didn't work 
the full details of it, but basically the idea is to solve a hierarchy of similar equations going from the vertex and then the sides of the simplex and then the face of the simplex and then the interior of the simplex and so on until we finish this entire process. I just want to present a, a, a numerical simulation. Uh, that's the, the, the right Fisher process for three types associated, that's a small problem here, associated to what's called the Hicks, uh, hock scissor paper game. It's an interesting game because it generates rotations in the simplex uh, because type one beats type two, that beats type three and so on, and they have a rotation, we see this rotation, but this was obtained from the right Fisher process solving uh, for, for finite population. And as we have theorems guaranteeing that if n goes to infinity, this will be the solution of the Kimura equation, that's a good numerical approximation of the solution of the Kimura equation. Um, these hock scissor papers, we can make some other numerical analysis here. We have exactly the same structure against rock, paper beats rock, and rock beats scissor, and scissor beats paper. Uh, this Numbers were chosen such that we have inward rotation, so this goes to the interior point. These are the fitness, given by evolutionary game theory, and the replicator dynamics is this one. We have four stationary uh, points for its replicator dynamics. These are the, the pure populations, but there, there is one more, which is for the mix of the populations. So the replicator dynamics is like this here, hoc, scissor, and papers. And the simulation of the, the right Fisher process, you can see this is, you now you cannot see it. I don't know exactly why, but uh, some technical problem here, Bro probably my fault. Uh, so we're not going to see. But basically the idea that we have a diffusion here, this uh, color blur here that goes to the, to the boundaries, why you see this vertex here rotating. One denotes the average and another, the another one denotes the mode, the most probable state. And you're going to see that they are, uh, we are not going to see. Uh, I mean, you can see this in the, in the website of one of the papers that, um, that I'm going to put in the, in the reference by myself and Max. Um, but basically, you're going to see that the average, uh, the, the dynamics of the average will depend on the initial condition, but the, the, the dynamics of, the, of the, the mode, the most probable uh, state in the interior, do not, do not depend on the initial condition. So basically, the replication equation, the equation is cannot be related to, to the average of the probability distribution, but it's likely that it's, um, the replicator equation is, is related to the most probable state. So let's just say my, some few words about other formulations. Let's talk about strategy dominance and finite populations. So one theorem that you can prove is the following. Uh, let theta of x, which is the fitness difference, be positive for all x. So have only two types, and one is dominant. So whatever happens, it's better to be type A than type B, theta is positive. Then the fixation probability is larger than X for all X. In particular, if A is the Nash strategy, it's the best someone can do against another one do, trying to do the best, then the fixation probability of type A is larger than the neutral probability. That's um, a theorem that we, we could expect. I mean, that's, we have a, a population um, modeled by a certain game and you have to, each individual has to think, what's the best thing that I, I can do? And what are you going to, in terms of the fixation probability in the long run, not in terms of the short-term gain. So the, what this theorem, theorem says is that the best thing that you can do is to play the Nash strategy. So the Nash strategy will maximize the fixation probability of that individual. But the point is that there are a lot of assumptions here. As you can see, this is for the Kimura equation, not for the right Fisher process. So this is for the right Fisher process if population is large, if n is large. But comes the question, if the population is small, what happens? So in a small population, can you expect that the larger fixation probability will be associated to the, to the Nash equilibrium? And the answer is in general, no. So let's, give a, let's study a very simple example, the public good games. We have n players that can contribute one euro or zero euro to a common pool. And then after all strategic decisions, all individuals decide if they're going to, to contribute, should be one, one hell, but uh, sorry. Uh, after all strategic decisions, the total contribution in the pool is multiplied by a set of factor r smaller than n, that's the most typical assumption, and divided in equal shares among all players. So the rational strategy, the strategy that maximizes payoff, 
is to contribute zero euros, no contribution at all. So that's the, the, the tragedy of the common, so there's no common good in this society because people uh, will receive the, the benefit independently if they contributed or not, so they decide to not contribute. This is a situation that can model, for example, um, uh, public illumination can mo uh, model uh, if you want to pay for, to, to have a security guard in our street or not, because you have the benefit respectively if you paid or not. So basically people decide to not pay in this kind of things that should be done by tax. But this is also models, for example, the evolution of anti antibiotic resistance, because one bacterium can survive using the, the chemicals that another bacteria produced to, to fight exactly the example that Jean presented before, uh, the Bactalactamase and the uh, Amoxilin. So this, this is a, a game that goes from human beings to cells. Um, but what happens if the population is small, meaning that this, this uh, factor here, R, is larger than N? This changes completely the game. So the, the evolutionary dynamics will lead to a non-contributive state. But the rational thing to do is to contribute one euro. So if R is larger than N, the best thing that you can do is to contribute one euro because this one euro is multiplied by a number that is larger than the population. Then you'll be divided by the, the population and get back more than one euro. But people that did not contribute will receive one euro more than people that contributed. So the evolution will... Um, we reproduce with, with more, we have a reproduction of more probability for non contributors. So we, we evolve to a non Nash equilibrium in this situation. Well, there are situations in nature that we have evolution for non Nash equilibrium. Uh, that's not clear if this model can be applied to this situation, but generally it's known as a spite. There are two types of spite Hamiltonian spite and Wilsonian spite. This is more related to what's called Hamiltonian spite. Um, and we find situations that are very difficult to explain without recurring to, to spite, and this could be an interesting model for spite. But the point here is that uh, small populations are very, very different from large populations. Um, tum, 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 what's that? No, I'm going to skip this. And then we'll go back to this uh, picture about the stochastic process here. Let's just focus on this new derivation and have to introduce a certain intermediate model here with continuous time but finite population. So instead of going both directly uh, one, uh, time step to zero in, finite, in population size to infinity, we just take the continuous time but keep the, the population size. And when it do, does this, we can rely on certain recent development in variational formulations of a stochastic process such that you can reformulate this in terms of minimization of certain operators. These two processes will be related, but we cannot talk about what's called gradient flow here. We can only talk about gradient flow here because we require continuous time. But we can see that you can go from here to the Kimura equation, but then we need to derive two continuous limits because the variation of formulation requires two things. A way to measure distance between different populations and an entropy here. But this process, the process that are used here, the Moran, the right fisher are not uh, irreducible, which is a central assumption to derive variational formulation. So we have to reformulate everything in an uh, irreducible form. And then you take the distance that uh, derived here to here, and the, 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 the entropy derived here to here, and then you have a variational formulation of the Kimura equation. That's something that we did. And then we can go to the replicator equation. When we do all this process here, the, the variational formulation of the replicator equation will have, also, again, two terms the entropy and the distance between two states, and the distance between two states will be exactly something very well known, which is so-called the Shashahan distance. But the Shashahan distance appears from the initial problem here in the, in the variational formulations of the Moran process. And now I see that you are taking pictures. No, you are not. <laughs> and Basically, uh, we, what we did already, we reformulate the Kimura equation as a gradient flow, as we did in the, in the discrete case, and then we show that both distance and potential in the finite population case converge to the Kimura equation counterpart. So this is sound, but this is only partially done. And then we show that effective population size converges to zero, the components of the gradient flow form of the Kimura equation, so we reformulated everything in terms of minimization of certain potential, converge to the replication equation counterpart. But what's really missing is the so-called Johann Kindelehrer Otto formalism, which means 
exactly what I'm saying here, that I want to minimize everything in discrete time steps. That's the, the, the thing that's still missing to this full picture. But I hope that we can do this in a, in a few weeks. So we construct a degenerated parabolic partial differential equation supplemented by conservation laws. So just summarizing everything, summing up everything I said. The Kimura equation is studied without reference to the original stochastic process. That's why uh, we needed the conservation laws. The initial dynamics given by the replicator equation. The replication equation models the most probable state in the theory of the simplex, not the average of the trait. This is something that is more numerical than mathematical. We did, didn't really prove that this. And you're using this PDE, meaning the Kimura equation, to obtain simple expression for the fixation probability and the fixation times that I did not present here for the right Fisher process. So we can use the continuous approximation to obtain information from the discrete case, and this works perfectly well. And these are the, the reference, some of them published, some of them still in archives, some of them not yet even written. So thank you for your attention.